the mainstream media defending Canada for honoring their former Nazis? <laughs> that was not on our 2020 bingo card. But alas, here we are following Canada's House of Commons honoring a former SS soldier, Yaroslav Hunka. A recent political op-ed states that history is complicated because, quote, fighting against the USSR at the time didn't necessarily make you a Nazi, just someone who had an excruciating choice over which of these two terror regimes to resist. The op-ed makes the case that it's true that Hunka should have never been invited to Canada's House of Commons, but not because he himself might be guilty of any crime, but because history is complex. In recent reporting, journalist Matt Taibbi begs the question, is this the worst op-ed in history? And writes, Politico gives National Socialism its finest makeover since springtime for Hitler. Journalist Matt Taibbi joins us now to discuss. Great to have you back. And I apologize, I think, for my misuse of the phrase, beg the question there. That's not what you're doing. Uh, you're raising important questions about what is going on with this op-ed. Uh, please educate us. Yeah, I, I, I've never been able to clear up exactly how to use that <laughs> phrase, but so it's okay. Yeah, I get it wrong, too. Uh, so, uh, so tell us more about this story. Yeah, I mean, this is just in the wake of, of that kind of unforced error in Canada where the Canadian Parliament invites, uh, you know, a, a former member of the Waffen-SS who had a demonstrable record of this, who had blogged about it, um, and has... You know, you have these incredible video scenes of the entire parliament standing and applauding, including Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Deputy Prime Minister uh, and former colleague of mine, Christia Freeland, from a uh, former reporter from Russia. Uh, they're all applauding this person. And then the response isn't to uh, basically say we screwed up or we're sorry, but uh, but to, you know, th there were editorials like this one basically saying, well, actually, you know, this is, it wasn't so bad to be a Nazi in this situation. I mean, there are two reasons why this editorial is crazy. One is that these are Canadians who are applauding somebody who is fighting on the other side of a war where Canadians died. Uh, and the other one is that I don't think the Nazis were terribly um, you know, interested in the subtleties of which uniform you were wearing um, you know, back in the day. That's, that's the whole point of why they're so villainous. So the idea that somebody who you know swore an allegiance to Hitler, it may not really be a Nazi. Uh, that that's a pretty unusual take to ever see in a in a prestigious publication. I mean, you're right to point out that the response wasn't just a pat. I'm sorry. This is embarrassing. I made a mistake. There was this effort to kind of wrap it up in this fear mongering about misinformation and disinformation. And weirdly, there was a statement from Trudeau that seemed to implicate that this was Russian disinformation and that we had to be careful about it. This is from folks who made the choice not just to bring this guy along, um, but to honor him and give him a standing of, of a uh, standing ovation. What, what did you make of the? response of the Canadian government to this. And have you seen any follow-up about uh, trying to tie this to this disinformation uh, fear that's afoot? Well, this angle to it fascinates me and kind of horrifies me. You're absolutely right. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau gave, um, in the wake of this on, on Yom Kippur, he, he gave a, a short uh, sort of off-the-cuff statement where he said it was a terrible thing. He didn't personally apologize. He said that the Speaker of the Commons had apologized. Um, and then he said, but we, you know, we have to be careful to, uh, you know, not to fall victim to Russian disinformation about this issue, as if this were uh, an episode of Russian disinformation. Now, from their point of view, what's, uh, you know, from after a year of studying this problem and looking at the Twitter files, I know what they're thinking. They actually do believe that somebody who is in alignment uh, with the views of, for instance, um, you know, uh, anti-Ukraine sentiment or, uh, or, the, or the fact that Russians may take advantage of this issue, that that means that this news is in itself disinformation. They've, they've used that as a definition of it and they've convinced some of the platforms that that's a, a definition of disinformation. And that's what's dangerous is that they're throwing these terms around um, when there is no disinformation here. The Russians weren't even a character in this story until Trudeau brought it up. Right, and there's, um, I think it's interesting um, who gets uh, the, how should I say this, 
in, in which cases um, nuance is applied to the Nazi label is becoming increasingly interesting. I mean, you have, like, in some circumstances, like, everyone on the right sort of being described as Nazi, you know, anyone who supports Trump but, uh, by, by the misinformation crowd, the people who are countering misinformation. But then when you have cases of, you know, actual, I mean, there, there are, it's, it's true, it's not, it's not misinformation to say it, actual cases of Nazi-aligned fighters on, for instance, the Ukrainian side, the side that the counter-misinformation people support, then it's like, well, it's complicated, and we, we need to understand the history. History and you know, which that's fine, true. I, I get that, but the benefit of the doubt, or the greater nuance, is not applied to the enemies or the the opponents of this cast of characters. Yeah, I mean, Justin Trudeau just uh, over a year ago was describing the Canadian truckers um, in negative terms for having Precisely. You know, people who who, for, who brandish swastikas. When actually, if you look at those pictures, it, it was almost entirely people who were waving pictures of swastikas and accusing the Canadian government of being Nazis. Uh, so they were invoking the imagery, yes, but they were doing it in a way to try to criticize the Canadian government. In the case of Ukraine, it, it is a little bit complicated. Look, I, I, there are there are neo-Nazis on both sides of this affair. I, I remember covering uh, skinhead marches outside of soccer uh, games in Russia. There was a burgeoning uh, far-right neo-Nazi movement uh, even back in the early 2000s. But to just flat out ignore uh, some of the, the, the use of this imagery or to say that it's not uh, really not, uh, Nazism or in the, in the case of this actual you know, uh, soldier, Yaroslav Hunka, who literally was a Nazi, that this is not actually you know, uh, Nazism, that, that uh, comparison is pretty graphic uh, between those two things. Part of this seems to be driven by a refusal or, let's say, some uh, some awkward tension around the reality of the heavy lift that the, the Soviet Union played in helping us to defeat Nazism, losing 27 million-odd soldiers in that effort, and having to kind of retrofit that reality into the contemporary context in which it is um, seditious to say anything nice about anything that ever happened in Russia, d done by a Russian. Uh, the Russian uh, tea room over on uh, Connecticut Ave got shut down after the war. People were trying to ban uh, Tolstoy. I mean, this is the environment where we're in, but the, the trying to retcon the Soviet Union's contributions to World War II does seem to be, to me, to be one of the more galling aspects of this. Well, right. And some of that is understandable because, of course, the history there is that uh, the Soviet Union initially concluded a, a one of the most cynical treaties in history, uh, the, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, where the Soviets and the, the National Socialists, who were absolute abject ideological enemies, they uh, sort of a, concluded a, a, a non-aggression treaty between the two of them, which Hitler then broke, bringing uh, the Soviet Union onto our side of the war. But the Russians and the Soviets uh, suffered uh, unimaginable horrors during World War II to degrees that I think Americans don't really understand. Uh, the scale of, of the death and the suffering was such that for generations later, there was a deficit of men in, uh, in the Soviet Union. It was difficult for women to find people to marry because there, was, there were so many people who had been killed during World War II. Um, and this continues to have a ripple effect throughout Russia today. Uh, and I, I think Americans don't and Canadians probably don't remember uh, exactly how difficult that war was uh, for the Soviet Union, for the people of the Soviet Union, not necessarily for the government, but for the people. Yeah, the people are always the ones that suffer in these conflicts, something we're uh, remembering, recalling very much right now, given what's going on in Israel. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on.